Hi folks, this is Alan Watt at CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com February the 28th, 2007 Started with a beautiful sky this morning Then watched the planes coming in to do their magic act with their crisscrossing massive trails right across from east to west and north to south making all kinds of weird and wonderful patterns with chemicals some of the planes even did U-turns and partial circles uh, quite uh, artistic in a sense, maybe they're getting more artists and as pilots unemployed maybe artists because they're getting more creative with their their sky mapping big X's as well because X marks the spot but we're not supposed to, supposed to really notice all this you see it's a hush hush thing we're supposed to be diverted and look at Iran because well my goodness who would have thought who would have thought that all the times that we were growing up in different generations that secretly the Iranians were the masterminds to take over the whole planet and at least that's what's emerging now from all the propaganda that's coming out of the West as they very demonize the enemy very old techniques terrify the publics of the world into lots of oh, weird and unimaginable crises caused by these nasty people over there and then go in and uh, do something about it uh, so much so that the people will eventually breathe a sigh of relief when you go in and blow them all to smithereens that's the standard techniques of demonization or uh, dehumanization too of the enemy we've watched it time after time down through countless centuries same technique, same formula and the drums beat the newspapers go into action with little snippets of my god the Iranians are going to destroy the Americans food crops they've been secretly possibly possibly secretly re-engineering all the food plants and, and it'll knock out the crops in the in the US breadbasket well you see that's that's nonsense because it's already been done by Monsanto and all the big boys since they have modified everything there is to modify including some of the insects but the drum beats go on and after Iran it'll be straight through into Syria since that's the agenda uh, that's the new American century plan the project for a new American century all coming to pass and we're supposed to sit back get terrified of these uh, masterminds over there in Iran who have been secretly planning to take over the whole planet and kept it so secret up till now we had no idea no idea at one time we thought it was the Soviets that were going to do it and then it was the Chinese uh, but no, it's, it's the Iranians uh, that's the real, the real masterminds and who would have thought, eh? this is the childish propaganda that unfortunately works so well why change a formula when it does work? Same old script. Demonize the enemy, terrify your own public until they're relieved when you go and invade the enemy. Standard tricks. You know, you can condition people to, to almost expect tragedy. In psychology, they know that the person who's afraid of everything is secretly, in a sense, wishes for it. And it isn't until their worst fears materialize that they feel a temporary relief, like a, like a phobic person. Yet they can train people, normal people, to experience this. We're on a rush now for a new planet, a new way of living, the global community where we live in little communes and this little commune over here will make 
the soles of the shoes and for the planet and this other commune will will make the upper tongue for the shoes and another bunch will make the laces for the shoes and will dress with flowers in her hair and beat tambourines doing simple peasant folk dances while the elite uh, jet set all over the planet and drop into the what were once country areas for the weekend of camping with all their servants from helicopters because there'll be nobody left on the rural areas they'll all be moved into the habitat areas making their shoes and laces and stuff to be self-supporting what a wonderful plan eh it's like something out of a fairy story and yet that's literally what the Agenda 21 system from the United Nations is all about. Agenda 21, where we'll all live in happy little folk-type communes with fixed populations. I used to wonder about that, actually, when I first came to Canada. And whether you're driving through Canada or the U.S., after you see all the Masonic signs uh, as you're driving into a town, you have a big board with all... It's telling you right away this is a Masonically controlled community. Then you'll see a, a billboard with the, the population of the town. And I used to wonder how could they get it so even? Because it'd have 2,000 or 2,100 2, or... 2,200, but it was always even figures, and I thought, my goodness, there's, there's awfully good population control. It was never 2,951 or anything like that. But in, a, in this upcoming habitat society, it will even be more perfect and natural. You'll, you'll have to keep a, a fixed population because the UN is supposed to dispense all the food, ultimately, when they're the big stick. Uh, our benefactors they'll dish out the, the food to each country as they've said themselves and it'll be up to the elite of each country to keep the population in control because you won't be given extra bread for extra mouths and no doubt once that's on the books and it's working and so many are getting aborted and and we're we're breeding for our needs as they say in this this practical society that's to come they'll then readjust it and, and make it lower and lower until there's only a few peasants making the shoes for the whole planet and, and the shoelaces and so on uh, that's what will happen they don't need such masses of people anymore we're all the useless eaters you see if you're not up there by Darwin standards the, the Darwin socialists that run the world if we haven't made it to the top and it's, and stayed there for a few generations showing we've got good genes you see if we haven't made it there then we're, we're the refuse we're the junk genes that they talk about we're the junk uh, we're the left behind amoebas that aren't going to progress any further and become a real person and so we're, we're all failures that's just it yep this is the sciences, uh, this is all the stuff that comes out of the scientific discussions. If you understand what they're saying, if you listen to the eugenics societies, which are now called bioethics committees, bioethics committees, isn't that nice and warm and fuzzy uh, for the same guys and same offspring, actually, of the same eugenicists who used to write massive books on, on the shape of your earlobe, and, and where your eyebrows were to decide if you had criminal traits. It's the same bunch, but they're now called, as I say, bioethics committees. And they've discussed everything under the sun, including who should live and die, all to serve this wonderful upcoming system. And no one voted these guys in. They just appeared one day when they first came out with um, the test tube babies that was the first rumblings that, that something was beginning to, to form to take care of this for the people for, for goodness sake we couldn't let the people get involved in this discussion no that would never do so they, they gradually had these 
foundation set up, funded from who knows where, but the bankers will flow their cash in there, no doubt. And when any major thing has to be decided to do with genetic engineering, re-engineering, or euthanasia, or any of these problems that they have, we have these bioethics committees that are non-governmental, but have governmental inputs. Isn't that something, eh? See, our whole lives are run by a new type Soviet. And that's what the Soviet meant. It was government by committees. We are living in the, the third way of Alvin Toffler, the title of his book, where capitalism and communism comes together to go the third way, where the elite will still run the show, uh, a Sovietized communistic bureaucracy of those lobsters they call it bureaucrats, you know, the ones that sit there with the steely eyes and, and don't see you as a person. It's just like a lobster looking at you. Well, the, the bureaucrats will be communized and they will take care of the masses beneath them. That's what it's all about, the third way, the combination of capitalism and communism. All planned in advance, discussed internationally in advance, Gorbachev wrote about it in his own book, Towards a New Civilization, the merging of the two, the two systems. And they were set up as apparent opposites by the old, old ancient brotherhood who understand all this stuff and are taught this from a very early age. If you want a change to come, you got to put forth an alteration to get a counter to the alteration and then come to a compromise and the compromise itself is the new way, the change the thesis, antithesis and synthesis you control all sides you can't simply do it by making a move and no one opposes you uh, stubborn refusal, refusal to be involved it doesn't go very well with them. You've got to get involved, so they make you involved one way or another. And then when you get something coming out of it that you'd never imagined, they can turn around honestly and tell you, well, you voted us in, you see. This is the, the technique of management of the herd, as they say. Thousands of years ago, they had their little folk sayings, as we always used to have little folk sayings, little ditties that would make sense like proverbs. And they used to say that when every a child is born, an individual child, your nature was your song. And so you'd have songs for so-and-so, and you'd get a song of Solomon, even though that's esoteric and doesn't mean what you think it does. But you sang your song, that was you living your life. Because the song was your life. In the old natural systems, each person would have their song. Some American Indians would have their particular individual song, like a theme tune. That was their way of communicating with whatever was out beyond them which they sensed a communication so they communicated by their personal song everyone should have their song and we're a tragedy to watch people literally mentally and by the destruction of the soul giving up that spark so early on in life and simply living to get old uh, there's no fire left in them the song has gone out of them I've uh, been involved in music I know what can be done to a song 
but also I know what can be done to your own song of life. And then we go through the school system where they pick apart your brain and then reshape it into what's authorized. And if you can't conform, you're, you're on Ritalin. I don't think anyone says it better than Melanie, who sings it with gusto. Speaking of songs, back in about 1844, I think it was Hebel who wrote a ballad called Der Heideknab. It was about a, a little boy going through his life and every fear that he had that could happen, every nightmare did happen, a form of fulfillment of your worst fears. What we have in this system, this world, is a perpetual fear-mongering from the media, because the media is part of government. To control people, you've got to have enemies, you've got to have fear, you've got to have a reason for the suits and ties at the top to stand proudly and, and gesticulate and pose and read the speeches that are written for them to tell us all how they're going to take care of the problems, even the ones that, that might be, all the might be's out there, all the fears of what could be to keep us in perpetual childhood. It's only in childhood that you expect all of your fears and problems to be taken care of by those who are older. And what a nightmare to wake up and find out the ones that are older don't know any better than you did. Boy, that's scary, isn't it? So all that time you looked up to adults who were just as confused as you were. They were just better actors. But that's the world we live in. And this same technique is used to control the minds of people, especially in this artificial system, which runs on what we're told is a big gambling casino called the stock market, where everyone's future is gambled away on a roulette table every day, and depending on the outcome of these masters of the game, we either crash or we keep going on and your job is going to be there tomorrow or it could be gone under in the blink of an eye depending on how that roulette table that wheel spins and where it stops thank goodness we have all these masters of things we haven't a clue of understanding to take care of it all for us and the reason we can't understand it is because it's all bogus whenever you cannot understand how anything works that is vital to your life and your survival and the survival of others, there's a con game going on. You're being fooled deliberately. It's like science. You see, science can be applied to anything. You can call anything science. You can create your own sciences tonight if you want to and put an ology on the end. Doctrine, you see. Or an ism. Ism also means doctrine. So you can create an, an, an ology or an ism and tack it on the end of a word and it could be your doctrine. And you can give a lot of scientific terms because the first thing you must do with any science is create your own vocabulary. Then only those you allow into the little secret club will know the secret meanings. Everyone else will be terribly, terribly impressed uh, but completely confused a and then you can give degrees out to your own people and then lord over those who are impressed but very confused that's what sciences are you know psychiatry will be the first to tell you they cannot cure anything they cannot cure mental illness in fact the definition of mental illness is very obscure. After all, if the norm is whatever is authorized 
for the majority at any one period in life or the ages then anything outside of that is therefore deviant and therefore abnormal and therefore ill so the whole idea is to get everyone into the majority think which is authorized by the big think at the top and then you're you're healthy we're taught to go to school every day put in so many hours and go back to home at night or the evening to get you and prepared for work that was what it was always for to get you into a routine where you'd, you'd go to work to earn something called money which is too mysterious it's a whole doctrine there's no point in trying to understand it uh, one day uh, these five pennies will buy this much bread the next day it'll be that much bread or less or more or whatever and it's all a big mystery it's all a big mystery in the old barter days before the con man who came along with money got involved you would have two people who would exchange this for that and they would decide between the two how much of this you'd trade for how much of that that was it because value and a price is only an idea that's all it is someone's idea an income the third party who conned them into using this thing called money which you can't eat and silver and gold are pretty useless for most things that you need they're no use for tools but here you are you're, you're getting something which is hard to find or harder to find that's why they picked that the Phoenicians were using it you know thousands of years ago they knew this too they had miners on the go all slaves slave workers and the con man got in between the two people who bartered made them believe it was of the same value a bag of oats is worth a bag of wheat and and then once you had the whole system under the stomach says oh well we need ten bags of that oats to go for that one bag of wheat and when you ask them why he'd, he'd tell you about scarcity of supply and demand and all this kind of stuff and and use his his new speak on you and eventually you throw your hands up and says geez if I have to understand all this I'll never get any work done and he says that's what I want and you went back to work and he ran the money and nothing has really changed up until the present this is the con game of money they used to tell you too just work hard work hard and, and you'll, you'll get up there in life you'll get on in life you can get out those um, scrubby old clothes and just work very very hard and you'll get noticed at work and one day you'll get up you, you even get a suit and tie one day and you'll be up in management positions and it's like pointing to a cave and telling 10 million people to run and try to get in there it doesn't dawn on everyone uh, that only so many will fit in to that cave you couldn't all get in so there can only be one or two or three or four or a few at the most and yet this is a con game that was pulled on everyone just work hard and, and, and you get up in life and isn't it strange no matter how many generations have worked hard they still really don't have much at all really when you when you boil it down they they rent a place which they think they've bought they get demand twice a year at least uh, from different branches of government demanding money for this the shell that they have like a tortoise shell only a tortoise shell is more enduring than little sticky things we have here called houses but money's demanded from them they still believe it's theirs because and they'll tell you that why well, I bought this place as they pay thousands of dollars a year for the privilege of owning this place and what you've just got yourself apart from a, a lifelong headache of repairing these ticky tacky houses which aren't meant to last in the first place and it does keep the lumber business going and all the tool places going uh, what you've got are, are, are four walls really four walls containing lots of air if you discard all the stuff that's inside all the the things you're supposed to have and all the plastic junk from China 
And all of that stuff that you're supposed to have is authorized that you have it. In fact, they would complain that you were neglecting your children if you don't have all that junk. So you can't win in this system by following the system. But all you've done is enclosed a, a lot of air and, and you get taxed for the privilege of breathing it inside that shell, which you don't own, but you've paid for. And when you go bankrupt and you're kicked off in the street and the bank sees it or the government sees it, but one of the two will seize it, you see, and there's no mercy anywhere. We wouldn't put an animal out like this, but you'd put humans out like that because others might get the idea that, oh, we've got rights. So they put you out in the street. And then the banks flip it again, and some other young pair of schmucks buy it, and start all over again. It's a tremendous con game in business. And even if you die, if, you're, if you, you manage to, to get through all the battles in life, and and crawl through battle scarred to the bitter ends and then you die in the place and put it in a will for relatives well in they come and take it from for death duties duties did you know you had a duty to do with death a duty death duties they call it and all of those years of frantic worrying and, and repairing and paying and paying and paying go nowhere, they, they, they'll seize it too if they don't get their cuts and who introduced this income tax and, and property tax etc and death duties well who introduced it in Britain was an organization an organization non-governmental but with the full backing of the British Crown the Royal Institute of International Affairs were the first ones to bring the property tax out, demand it, the income tax, death duties, and so on. And who did it in the USA? Their brothers, their brother company, the Council on Foreign Relations brought it in. And they have that in their own books. And they're proud of it. Proud of it, yeah. As, and they should really give prizes to these people for conning generations of people. Now it's true they generally bring a lot of this stuff in when they have major wars and things going which is fairly common for them and we don't notice it so much during the crisis periods and immediately after a war people are so war weary they just want some peace they don't want any more involvement with major problems and decisions and and fear etc so they, they try and push it all out of their, their mind the next generation grows up thinking it's always been this way it must be normal and shortly it will be normal to go into get a chip in your brain at a certain age and they'll think it's normal because mum and dad did it or maybe they won't have mum and dad or maybe mum and dad will be one person in fact, maybe they'll be cloned from mum and from mum and dad in one person. Gets awfully confusing, doesn't it? Hmm? This is the brave new world that we've been led along to. In the Matrix movie, Morpheus, who changes shape in every era, you see, and always says the same thing in every era, every time. It says to Neo, he says, you're a slave, Neo. You wouldn't believe the relief that people get when it suddenly hits them. They're a slave. All the fears I've had, the worries tend to vanish like a massive weight sticking off your shoulders because suddenly you understand things. You understand why things aren't working out for you. You understand now that you've done all the right things but you haven't got what you were taught you were going to get. This great big award at the end of your life. 
you can stop blaming yourself for not achieving that which you, which you were supposed to achieve and you can throw away that uh, underachiever guilt complex because achievement doesn't come by hard work it, it comes by who you know and what societies and organizations you have joined that's how it comes that's the real world that's the real world people wonder what can be done on a personal level when they look at this world and feel overwhelmed by all the terror news where everything's going to fail and epidemics are coming our way uh, oh we're warming up the planet must be all those jet engines from the special aircraft as they spray El Nino and yada 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 and this is all techniques of controlling people because government needs panic in order to give out orders for control and to maintain control that's why in war situations they get away with so much people give up everyday rights thinking it's for the greater good and the governments have a field day with that they love to take away rights to make themselves feel more secure because egotists that crawl to the top and stab their way to the top want power and those who crave power think everyone else must be the same as themselves so they become ultimately ruthless therefore the more panic they can create in order to, to protect you and justify their reason for being a tyrant the more they will do that's your history that's your history in detail in fact that's all you have to really know same techniques over and over again well the individual can do a lot it's not a matter of going out and evangelizing to those you know best you'll be looked upon as a space alien or a reptilian person or some nonsense like that because you're talking a language that doesn't come from the six o'clock news you're giving them details and facts about things which really are foreign content to them they haven't got it from their newspeak the television set if it came on the television set then they would listen and they'd talk and converse about the subject but if you're telling them things which are not from that six o'clock news you must be talking from another planet so don't evangelize to those around you unless you want to alienate them from you and why cause trouble for yourself that way when this is pointless anyway you must seek out those who are asking questions it doesn't mean that you'll end up on the same path necessarily by teaching them or exchanging views but at least you can get certain topics broached and you can bounce ideas back and forth when you're up against a system that's thousands of years old at least thousands of years old a science you don't expect to knock it down in one fell swoop you've got to take time to chip it away and you'd be surprised how the largest object will come down when you just chip away like a beaver I've watched beavers go to work on trees until they have almost a pencil point of a tree trunk balancing on the other point of another pencil that's what it looks like and they are terrific engineers they know how long it's going to take to finish this tree they know where they want it to fall what direction they want it to fall and when to get out of the way when it starts falling 
they know all of that and they have patience patience and when you watch a beaver he does it on his own he doesn't go around saying gee that's a huge tree I better get a whole bunch of beaver here and we, we can all go at it he starts his own chipping away he doesn't look for confirmation am I doing a good job he just knows he is because he's got patience and this big monster of a tree will eventually fall and it will fall exactly where you wanted it to fall and afterwards he doesn't look around for applause he's done for what was for him a natural thing the largest things can fall by the acts and the patience of someone who puts some life into what they're doing when you realize there is a real war going on very deceptive well camouflaged but you understand what it is and you realize that everything else takes second or third place then you start putting your life into something that's real and worthwhile and just like the beaver you don't look around for applause at the end of it the reason there's information to be passed on is because people in past ages few to be sure but enough to pass on the information did so and that's made all the difference in the world in a, a very specific way the reason the deception is used today to control masses of people is because of the people who were awake in previous ages passing on knowledge otherwise we'd all be chipped long ago or lobotomized long ago completely lobotomized it's only been the more cautious and devious way of governments way of getting round that that's led them to create such a system of massive propaganda and indoctrination through television and media and schooling it wouldn't be necessary except for people who passed on knowledge and wisdom through countless centuries the, the people who could point to the king and say he has no clothes and break the spell that held the masses that's what it takes but it takes life and when you look at what people really are doing with themselves they're doing what's authorized to be good citizens upstanding upright all those masonic terms all those authorized things and yet they're not alive they're not living they're putting time in they're killing time really and as they kill time they're killing themselves and there's nothing more worthwhile that brings the flame alive than getting involved uh, keeping your cool as you do it and passing on just enough information here and there that maybe one day will alight the fire in someone else when the words come back to them that you have uttered at the right time that's how knowledge has been passed on otherwise the whole planet would be watching sports and thank goodness with all the massive indoctrinations they haven't reached that stage yet to put so much in to a few lines sometimes you have to check yourself because so much 
can be contained in few words, words being a language, and the way you put them together must come from your own heart. When it does, and there's no show put on, no bluff, no con game at work, you reach people. Simply be sincere, but make sure that you believe in what you're saying first. And you will find that people come alive because they can't debate or argue when it truly comes from the heart. I think it was Heine who said, Oh, aus meinem großen Schmerzen mache ich die kleinen Leider, which said, from my great sorrows I make small songs. In other words, in the depths of areas you allow yourself to go into with the emotions which are part of being human can bring out tremendous wisdom and yet you can never condense everything you've learned into even a book about it because you personally will learn so much you know we, we live in a a world where most people truly are afraid to contact people around them or simply say something they want to say for fear of breaking the silence or shattering the illusion they want to conform they want to give up their own personal song and conform to the authorized choir and that's the death of not only individuals it's the death ultimately of humanity when you're all singing in the same choir because that means someone's conducting you and someone wrote the song but not you what a dull dreary world that would be when there's no possible way to see variation when there's no point visiting someone because you know what they're going to say why go there when you know what they're going to say people do things through habit nowadays they even visit each other through habit everything becomes habit as they put time in just putting in time you have a life to live and yet they're putting time in where their own creativity could be used to the full they switch on televisions and read novels and find ways to pass the time ways where experts will write the program for them you don't participate watching a movie or watching anything for that matter you're being downloaded by someone who sat down to write something and now it's been downloaded into you not so much because you're interested in it but because you want to pass the time to pass away the essence that is living when children were cooped up at one time before they had computer games and sat and fiddled with their thumbs and fingers with a little plastic thing they used to go outdoors and burn off their energy mind you they were a bit fitter they didn't have all the modified food not as badly anyway that we know of and they didn't have as many inoculations so they had energy to burn but they were never bored never bored it's scary today to talk 
to a lot of youngsters, the ones who do sit with their games and, and twiddle their fingers with the plastic thing, and you know, have their eyes fixed on something, a screen. And if they don't have that game, or they've done it so many times, they'll, they'll sit there and they'll sigh. If you ask them what's wrong, they'll say, I'm bored. Here they have a life to live. When you're young, you think you'll live forever. Death is a foreign concept. It's more so today, now that you don't see anyone who's dead. Everything is sanitized and taken care of somewhere else. But they have one life to live and they're bored. Already bored. To go somewhere and see things or look or think for themselves is almost a foreign idea to them. They've grown up to believe that you pay for entertainment, you pay money. If you don't pay, then it cannot be valuable. So they always want money to go and visit things and see things. It would never occur to them to simply get out into the country and, and hike through a forest on their own. They're bored. Boredom. Their song, if it ever was there, is now quenched already. Because a song in a person is your fire. It's, it's the driving force within yourself. The, it gives you the inquisitiveness. It gives you the yearning to be excited and go and look and see and do. And eventually they'll be world weary where the cares of this world will be so overwhelming as they go through the years, they'll want to switch off themselves because it's all so terrifying to them. Most of all the fear-mongering in all ages is fabricated nonsense, most of it. Not all of it, but most of it. And we cannot allow that to get us down until our fire is quenched. The fact today that there are people who are still awake can verbalize what's happening, cut through all the illusions, cut through all the propaganda, the counterintelligence that's put out there to make you drift off into space, chase lizards all over the place, follow gurus who wear funny clothes but look as if they know something and look terribly pious and those ones who I call the card sharks who give you futures from a piece of paper or a bunch of paper people want predictions only when they're terrified of making their own life because living is a chance everything in life is a chance and only those who die internally do so because they won't take chances till eventually they'll be much older and they'll say it's too late for me to alter anything why would you choose to live in a life of misery when the fate of the future lies within you if you care to start utilizing it if you utilize that drive within you in any way you can it doesn't mean you become famous it doesn't mean you become rich you won't become rich if you're doing it the right way unless you get the backing of governments but you'll be rich in wisdom rich in experience, rich in friends you'll be richer by far than those that 
chase the things of the world, the material stuff, because ultimately all we have really here is each other. And by that I don't mean the, the faces we put on, the authorized faces, the pretenses, I'm talking about the real people within, that that's what life really is about. The acting, uh, the persona people project is the authorized version that someone somewhere at some time decided we're all supposed to copy. I've said many times, this is the place, the war zone, where everything meets in the world of matter, the plane of matter. We can't allow ourselves to be psychologically put under by deceptions or worry or stress and fear. When you realize we're all going to die, hopefully not all at the same time, but judging from what we've seen of the past, everyone eventually dies. When you realize how precious life itself is, and that there's supposed to be a joy in living, a joy, then you have to claim that back again and tell those who are trying to destroy it to get off your back. And that as a <laughs> sovereign being that came into this world like everyone else, by the same methods, we have a right to participate in the decision making that affects us. We don't need other people to tell us how we should be, how we should live, what we should do. In some authoritarian manner as though they came out some special birth canal. The pretense has gone on long enough and the elite know this. They know this cannot go on for much longer. That's why the hype to get us dumbed down by every means possible, including chemical warfare and the doping from the skies and all the other things they're doing, they're doing. With the food, there's no doubt on that, food is a weapon. You would alter the food to alter the people and to make the masses more manageable and placid. Things which were discussed a long time ago world meetings. And yet here we are, there are still people who can think, who can get through the haze and the maze of disinformation and hype and fear-mongering and cut to the core. Why? Because Life is not just mine, it's yours too. Life is for those to come as well. And life is supposed to be lived. Not fretted through and worried through or cried through. It's supposed to be lived, even though you'll do all of those things at some time, but not all the time. So rather than go through life worrying and fuming and fretting of what they will do next, the big they, do something with it. More sites are going up shortly. It's going to take a lot of work to do so. So people who try and phone probably won't get through and I spend so much time on the phone I can't really afford it anymore now that we're getting to crucial stages of this global battle so I'll have to be patient as I try and get these sites up and get things working and expanding 
So to finish up, I'd just like to repeat, don't simply put your time in like a prison sentence. Stop passing time and start doing something with it, with your the fire, with your own song. Sorry for the rush blurb, but it's been a hectic day. I hope you're all doing well. For me and Hamish, it's good night. And may your gods, or God, or favourite poem, go with you. The drum beats go on, and after Iran, it'll be straight through into Syria. Since that's the agenda, uh, that's the new American century plan, the project for a new American century, all coming to pass. And we're supposed to sit back, get terrified of these uh, masterminds over there in Iran who have been secretly planning to take over the whole planet and kept it so secret up till now, we had no idea, no idea. At one time we thought it was the Soviets that were going to do it, and then it was the Chinese. Uh, but no, it's, it's the Iranians. Uh, that's the real, the real masterminds. And who would have thought, eh? This is the childish propaganda that unfortunately works so well. Why change a formula when it does work? Same old script. Demonize the enemy, terrify your own public until they're relieved when you go and invade the enemy. Standard tricks. You know, you can condition people to, to almost expect tragedy. In psychology, they know that the person who's afraid of everything is secretly, in a sense, wishes for it. And it isn't until their worst fears materialize that they feel a temporary relief, like a, like a phobic person. Yet they can train people, normal people, to experience this. We're on a rush now for a new planet, a new way of living. The global community, where we live in little communes, and this little commune over here will make the soles of the shoes and for the planet. And this other commune will, will make the upper tongue for the shoes. And another bunch will make the laces for the shoes. And will dress with flowers in her hair and beat tambourines, doing simple peasant folk dances, while the elite jet set all over the planet and drop into the what were once country areas for the weekend of camping with all their servants from helicopters because there'll be nobody left on the rural areas they'll all be moved into the habitat areas making their shoes and laces and stuff to be self-supporting what a wonderful plan eh? it's like something out of a fairy story and yet that's literally what the agenda 21 system from hi folks this is alan watt at cutting through the matrix dot com february the twenty eighth two thousand and seven started with a beautiful sky this morning then watched the planes coming in to do their magic act with their crisscrossing massive trails right across from east to west and north to south making all kinds of weird and wonderful patterns with chemicals some of the planes even did u-turns and partial circles uh, quite uh, artistic in a sense maybe they're getting more artists and as pilots unemployed maybe artists because they're getting more creative with their their sky mapping big X's as well because X marks the spot but we're not supposed to, supposed to really notice all this you see it's a hush hush thing we're supposed to be diverted 
and look at Iran because, well, my goodness, who would have thought, who would have thought that all the times that we were growing up in different generations that secretly the Iranians were the masterminds to take over the whole planet. And at least that's what's emerging now from all the propaganda that's coming out of the West as they very demonize the enemy. Very old techniques terrify the publics of the world into lots of oh, weird and unimaginable crises caused by these nasty people over there and then go in and uh, do something about it uh, so much so that the people will eventually breathe a sigh of relief when you go in and blow them all to smithereens uh, that's the standard techniques of demonization or dehumanization too of the enemy we've watched it time after time down through countless centuries same technique, same formula and the drums beat. The newspapers go into action with little snippets of my god the Iranians are going to destroy the Americans food crops. They've been secretly, possibly, possibly secretly re-engineering all the food plants and, and it'll knock out the crops in the in the US breadbasket. Well you see that's that's nonsense because it's already been done by Monsanto and all the big boys since they modified everything there is to modify including some of the insects. But they're called bioethics committees. Bioethics committees. Isn't that nice and warm and fuzzy? For the same guys and same offspring, actually, of the same eugenicists who used to write massive books on, on the shape of your earlobe and, and where your eyebrows were to decide if you had criminal traits. It's the same bunch, but they're now called as I say, bioethics committees. And they've discussed everything under the sun, including who should live and die, all to serve this wonderful upcoming system. And no one voted these guys in. They just appeared one day when they first came out with um, the test tube babies. That was the first rumblings that, that something was beginning to, to form to take care of this for the people. For, for goodness sake, we couldn't let the people get involved in this discussion. No, that would never do. So they, they gradually had these foundations set up, funded from who knows where, but the bankers will flow their cash in there, no doubt. And when any major thing has to be decided to do with genetic engineering, re-engineering, or euthanasia, or any of these problems that they have, we have these bioethics committees. They are non-governmental, but have governmental inputs. Isn't that something, eh? See, our whole lives are run by a new type Soviet. And that's what the Soviet meant. It was government by committees. We are living in the, the third way of Alvin Toffler, the title of his book, where capitalism and communism comes together to go the third way where the elite will still run the show uh, a Sovietized communistic bureaucracy of those lobsters they call bureaucrats you know the ones that sit there with the steely eyes and, and don't see you as a person it's just like a lobster looking at you well the, the bureaucrats will be communized and they will take care of the masses beneath them that's what it's all about, the third way, the combination of capitalism and communism. All planned in advance, discussed internationally in advance. Gorbachev wrote about it in his own book, Towards a New Civilization, the merging of the two, the two systems. And they were set up as apparent opposites by the old, old ancient brotherhood who understand all this stuff and are taught this from a very early age. If you want a change to come, you've got to put forth an alteration to get a counter to the alteration and then come to a compromise. And the compromise itself 
is the new way, the change. The thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You control all sides. You can't simply do it by making a move and no one opposes you. Uh, stubborn refusal, refusal to be involved uh, doesn't go very well with them. You've got to get involved, so they make you involved one way or another. And then when you get something coming out of it that you'd never imagined, they can turn around honestly and tell you, well, you voted as in, you see. This is the, the technique of management of the herd, as they say. Thousands of years ago, they had their little folk sayings, as we always used to have little folk sayings, little ditties that would make sense like proverbs. And they used to say that when every, a child is born, an individual child, your nature was your song. And so you'd have songs for so-and-so, and, -so and you had a Song of Solomon, even though that's esoteric and doesn't mean what you think it does. But you sang your song, that was you living your life, because the song was your life. In the old natural systems, each person would have their song. Some American Indians would have their particular individual song, like a theme tune. That was their way of communicating with whatever was out beyond them, which they sensed. A communication, so they communicated by their personal song. Everyone should have their song. And we're a tragedy to watch people literally, mentally, and by the destruction of the soul, giving up that spark so early on in life and simply living to get old. Uh, there's no fire left in them. The song has gone out of them. I've uh, been involved in music. I know what can be done to a song, but also I know what can be done United Nations is all about. Agenda 21, where we'll all live in happy little folk-type communes with fixed populations. I used to wonder about that, actually, when I first came to Canada. And whether you're driving through Canada or the U.S., after you see all the Masonic signs uh, as you're driving into a town, you have a big board with all... It's telling you right away this is a Masonically controlled community. Then you'll see a, a billboard with the, the population of the town. And I used to wonder how could they get it so even? Because it'd have 2,000 or 2,100 2, or 2,200. But it was always even figures. And I thought, my goodness, there's, there's awfully good population control. It was never 2,951 or anything like that. But in, a, in this upcoming Habitat Society, it will even be more perfect and natural. You'll, you'll have to keep a, a fixed population because the UN is supposed to dispense all the food, ultimately, when they're the big stick, uh, our benefactors. They'll dish out the, the food to each country as they've said themselves, and it'll be up to the elite of each country to keep the population in control because you won't be given extra bread for extra mouths. And no doubt once that's on the books and it's working and so many are getting aborted and, and we're, we're breeding for our needs, as they say, in this, this practical society that's to come, they'll then readjust it and, and make it lower and lower until there's only a few peasants making the shoes for the whole planet and, and the shoelaces and so on. Uh, that's what will happen. They don't need such masses of people anymore. We're all the useless eaters. You see, if you're not up there, 
by Darwin standards, the, the Darwin socialists that run the world, if we haven't made it to the top and, it's, and stayed there for a few generations, showing we've got good genes, you see, if we haven't made it there, then we're, we're the refuse, we're the junk genes that they talk about. We're the junk. Uh, we're the left behind amoebas that aren't going to progress any further and become a real person. And so we're, we're all failures. That's just it. Yep. This is the sciences. Uh, this is all the stuff that comes out of the scientific discussions. If you understand what they're saying, if you listen to the eugenics societies which are now